Good afternoon, and you're all very welcome to our event. I'm Linda Waters, Business Development Manager with Learnabate, and I'll be your MC for the next two hours. So first, a little bit about Learnabate. We're a technology research centre based in Trinity College with established industry-led research model that enables that the research and technology we're developing is driven by industry needs. Over the last 12 years at Learnabate, we have created a large body of knowledge, extensive state-of-the-art analysis and systems, platform and tools, that support de delivery of adaptive online learning assessment and collaboration. We're delighted to have such a high level of interest in this year's first Link and Learn series of webinars on remote learning, which has proven to be a very popular subject. I'd like to give a big welcome to my colleague, Janet Benson, who is our learning lead here in Learnovate. And she's gonna bring us through her research that she's carried out with our UX specialist, Richard Hart, Richard and Janet have conducted research and some best practice on how on, to onboard new employees successfully, taking into account what works in the face-to-face -face world and what tools and technology industry um, is using to support their remote employee onboarding processes. Um, we're the first phase of this project and we hope to engage some of you in getting involved with Learnovate and contributing to this research project, but also to other research areas that we're focusing on within the centre. For now though, over to you, Janet. Thanks very much, Linda, for that introduction. So as Linda said, I'm the learning lead at Learnovate. So um, I'm very passionate about everything to do with learning from learning theory to learning design to particularly learning technology, which is um, something that we do here in the centre obviously very well. And we do our research into those areas. So um, today what I'm going to do is um, talk to you a little bit about a, the research that myself and my colleague Richie have been carrying out in the area of remote onboarding. Um, and I mean, we are all aware and even just looking in the chat at the moment, it's something that I think we're all dealing with at the moment. So many of us are working from home when we have so many specific challenges into, you know, getting people engaged and working online. So I suppose remote onboarding is kind of the first step in that process. If we're bringing somebody new to an organization, how do we engage them and get them on board with the company? right from the start. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to share um, my slides and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn off my video for now so that hopefully um, my slides will show up bigger for you on the screen. Um, so today, we're, as I said, we're going to talk about remote onboarding um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the research we've conducted into the space of the problems, the challenges that we're seeing, some potential solutions. And then my colleague, Dr. Richard Hart, is going to talk about the tools and technologies that we researched um, and the state of the market, state of the art um, research that he did in that particular space. Um, um, and just to give a sort of a high level overview of what we'll talk about today. So a little bit about what is onboarding. So sort of to kind of get us all on the same page with what we all understand about what onboarding actually is and what it isn't as well. And um, again, some of the challenges that we, we are seeing from our industry partners and our members of Learnovate to see like, you know, what is it that we are facing in relation to um, onboarding people in an online space? And then what are some of the consequences we've we've gathered from the research into what a poor onboarding or even just a mediocre onboarding experience can, can deliver to the business and to potentially new employees? So I'm going to talk a little bit about potential solutions um, to some of the issues that we're seeing and some of the challenges. But I think it's important to reiterate that this is a project that Learnovate are currently working on. We're in the middle of this project. Um, and as Linda mentioned at the, at the intro, we are looking for you know, more industry partners to get involved with us at Learnovate. We would love more members to kind of get involved in this particular area of research um, and we want to do something really innovative in the space of a remote onboarding so we work very closely with industry and our research is very much in the applied um, research space so we do everything with with our industry partners our clients and our members in mind so we'll talk a little bit about potential solutions but just a caveat to say that we are still in the midst of this research and um, so what we're going to share with you today is some of the sort of desk or, or state of the market research we've done to date so as i as i said we'll start with what is onboarding so we're all on the same page and I think onboarding is something that we sometimes hear referred to as induction or, you know, orientation is another one that I've had experience of it being called. But what we want to say is onboarding here is definitely the process of integrating a new employee into an organization. And um, so it's, it's about that new that new person joining an organization and having, you know, that that experience. And we're not looking at product onboarding today. So just in case anyone was was confused about what we were going to look at, it's very much that that new employee. Um, and from the research, 
we quite like this definition of the process of helping new hires to adjust. Um, so it's, it's, it's that sort of social and performance side of things. So we'll talk a little bit about the socialization aspect of onboarding and how we also want people to really, from the business perspective, we want to get people up and running and adding value to the company, as well as feeling part of the, of the new organization and their culture as quickly and smoothly as possible. So what we want to do is provide our new employees with a really smooth, really nice experience while also getting them feel conf you know feeling confident about engaging in work in their new in their new workplace and we as part of the research as well we've seen that there are lots of different examples of different stages of of that onboarding process and what we've kind of gathered up is these four are sort of what fit for what what we need from our research so we're going to look a little bit about what pre onboarding is so some of those tasks that new recruits or new employees can complete before they ever set foot in the company. So some of that admin type work or familiarization with the new organization before the official event, inverted commas, of onboarding sort of takes off or before they, they have their first day in the organization. Um, and then we also know that introductions are a huge part of that onboarding process. So whether it's introductions to um, the new employee's manager, to some of their colleagues, but also to people in departments which in, with which they'll engage or in part, um, departments that are very important to the organization in general. So you'll find that an onboarding sort of process or an onboarding event tends to involve a lot of these introductions and presentations by people in lots of different areas. Um, and again, that can be, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it, it can be quite overwhelming in the first few days to kind of get a lot of this information all together without having necessarily a full understanding about what the job entails and how you will interact with these different departments. So again, that's these are some of the challenges that we'll kind of look at. Um, and we do sort of advocate for people having some kind of assignments to do as part of their onboarding experience because again you can feel as a new employee if you're not giving some given something solid to do and from the start you're kind of waiting for things to happen and that can be sort of a, a sort of a negative or a, a kind of a, a waiting game experience which which isn't necessarily the best way to get involved with a new business so or, an, or a new role so it's nice to have something solid to do and not feel that you're being given tasks just for the sake of giving you something to do so it's good to think about what those assignments might be as part of an onboarding experience and then how can you continue that that development or that onboarding experience over a period of time whereby we look at it as not necessarily um, a one-off event, but more, um, you know, a, a sort of a, an ongoing process that that becomes sort of a cu the culture of the organization to kind of have that experience whereby even though someone is onboarded initially into the company, that it's sort of an ongoing experience whereby they're still learning, you know, that we're facilitating those mentorship um, and those, you know, those interactions with other members of the organization in order that the person continues to kind of, you know, to kind of continue that journey and make sure that even when they maybe change roles within the organization, that it's kind of a flawless move, um, that it's a smooth sort of continuous process that is that is engaged with as part of as part of the onboarding. Um, and I think, you know, I'd say most of the people that are here today will be aware of some of those key elements of that onboarding process. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think that people are aware currently what onboarding looks like, whether that's face to face or in that online space, there are a lot of these different elements that are part of that. So it's the basic information, you know, where is where is the cafeteria? You know, where do I park? You know, these sorts of things that I think if they're not addressed prior to somebody arriving that on that first day, they can add a sort of an extra layer of stress. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, positive and negative experiences of onboarding later on. And I have a couple of myself that I might share. Um, but it's it's good to get a feel for like how do we take the stress away from the new person as much as possible so they only have to focus on their onboarding experience and not the little small things about well do I need to pack a sandwich to bring to work or am I going to look like a bit of a fool if I arrive you know with food for example and um, again you know we talk about discussion of job expectations any of the sort of performance management type stuff tends to happen up front we want to integrate somebody into the company mission the values and that company culture um, and again that's something that is quite challenging in a remote or online onboarding space so we'll talk about that a little bit Bit later on as well that that's an important element of this whole onboarding process and um, again we talked about um, introductions already there is a certain level of training or you know prerequisite training that people do tend to have to take as part of that initial onboarding piece so whether that's you know we're all aware of sort of having to do manual handling or any awareness of, of safety type procedures um, and again we're going to talk about tasks and assignments and the mentorship or that buddy system because that's such a huge hugely important part of an onboarding experience but particularly one that needs to be facilitated in this remote um, working situation so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail 
uh, later on. So just to say, I mean, one of the other things that we found from the research is that this process, depending on the company, depending on your manager, depending on a whole lot of different factors, the process can take from a few hours, maybe as, you know, a half day in a room with someone from HR or L&D to a few months. So it could be that more, you know, sort of long term um, experience that is, is sort of what we're kind of looking at here is embedding it into a culture and making it less of an event and more of a sort of an ongoing process. But again, we always say that, you know, it has to sort of happen as, as close to the start date as possible. So again, we don't want our employees to be embedded um, into the company before they actually learn about the cultures or the things that they potentially should be doing or people that they should be talking to um, too late. So, you know, for the most part, uh, like we are aware that most companies do this quite early on in the, in, in the new employee experience. So to start with, we will talk about some of the challenges, but again, you know, there's a lot of research out there about what the, the consequences are to a poor onboarding experience, but I think it's good to start on a positive. So this, this quote from the research, I think is a really nice one, is that, you know, onboarding is a costly business, but almost 70% of employees who have a positive experience are likely to remain with the employer for three years, which is a really nice statistic and something for us to take into account when we're, when we're creating those onboarding experience to know that there are really good positive outcomes if we do something that's that's really good. Um, so what we'll do is move to like, you know, what some of the challenges are that we've seen from the research, but also in our discussions with our industry partners and with, you know, some of our clients and members and learn about some of the things that are they're talking to us about. Um, and one of them is definitely, you know, it, it can often be a one size fits all approach. And that can be for a number of reasons. Obviously, it can be it can be costly and resource heavy to create an onboarding experience, even a face to face environment. But it, it's worth taking into account that, you know, this one size fits all sort of of sweep experience doesn't necessarily work that well when we think about people coming from different backgrounds, different experiences, different roles. Um, and we and we look at that, but if there's anyone here that's from learning and development, you know, we kind of try to make learning that's that's not covering too much, you know, with 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 too little in that we're trying to make it as relevant as possible where we can so people don't tend to switch off. Um, with the onboarding experience, we kind of create one experience and we give it to absolutely everybody. And we find that that's not necessary the best way to go about it. And we are, you know, at Learn of It, we do understand the constraints and the challenges with industry um, in that we can't create a completely personalized experience for every person that works walks through the door. But we'll talk a little bit about how maybe we can we can put groups of experiences together. And we found as well from the research, and Richie will probably talk about this a little later too with regards to the technology, is that the focus can often be on the information that we as a company want to impart rather than really focusing on what the new employee needs or wants from that experience. And it's something we look at with regard to learning as well. You know, let's look at the learner, put the learner at the center of the experience and understand what the experience is like for them rather than just going, well, look, we need to tick these boxes as a HR department or an L&D department or whatever it is and make sure, you know, this person is bombarded with all this information but once they have it our job is done so think about you know what is it that they need from the experience and put yourself in their shoes which is sort of what we were trying to do there and um, with our with our exercise in networking and we need those structured support mechanisms um you know for that sort of buddy or mentor experience i think particularly in a in, a, in the remote situation and um, this can be quite a challenge in that we need to make sure that there's a structured explicit set of sort of processes and, and steps in place for this support um function because otherwise it can tend to fall by the wayside a little bit and i think because in the face-to-face -face environment we often assume that some of these things will happen sort of organically it's something that we can't really assume in the face of or in the in sorry in the remote or online experience because it's just not facilitated in that way so we need to look at see what are the supports and um, that a new employee needs but also what supports does their manager need what support does this buddy or mentor person need to be able to provide a really consistent and a really positive experience for the new employee so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a sec the social aspect again is something that is often overlooked and it sort of relates to what I just said around you know this is something that tends to happen quite ad hoc it's sort of implicit in an organization that you will sort of, you know, bump into people, you know, your, your colleagues that you will work with will take you for lunch or whatever those little bits and pieces are. But in a, in a remote um, setting and when people are at home, we need to really encourage those interactions, facilitate them and make sure they're part of the experience and that they're not overlooked. Because we all know that, like, you know, 
I suppose if we're starting a new organization, one of the first things that we think about is, you know, are the people going to be nice? Are the people that I work with going to be friendly? We know we're going to be spending so much time with these people that we have to know that we can actually get along together and we can go for lunch with somebody. And it doesn't have to be, I love everyone in my organization, but we have to support that social side of the integration of someone into a new, new organization. And we'll talk a little bit about how we'll do that. Um, and again, kind of going back to the one size fits all, like some of these assignments can be very general. And if they're not specific to a person's role or a department or, you know, to what, what they're going to be doing in the new organization, it will cause them to disengage because they'll think, well, do you know, as a, a, in the same way that some training goes over people's heads, it's like, well, I'll never work in that department. Why do I need to learn about, for example, hazardous chemicals? Um, so again, you know, let's try to make it more specific to what somebody's going to be doing or the area they're going to be working and give them something that actually challenges them and lets them get their teeth into something um, rather than just kind of giving somebody an assignment just for the sake of it because people are aware that that you know that that is what's happening um and ensuring that you know we're setting expectations is really important so understanding that new recruits need to know what's expected them and those timelines so again not only does it sort of set them up for a level of success it gives them those feelings of um, achievement that they've kind of completed different tasks and also they know when they have to do particular things so nothing is a surprise so they're not you know faced with someone from HR going oh did you get that done kind of thing um, so we need to kind of make sure that we're setting those expectations very clearly and um, so talking about the challenges I mean the research is here to say you know 70% of new hires leave an organization during the first three months which is is very high particularly when we think about the cost associated and the resource cost associated with the onboarding um, and the nice the first 90 days are crucial so it I think this is a nice one because it's about looking at onboarding as a real opportunity to maximize an experience and get somebody in the door and and really get somebody as part you know part of the organization with a really good experience. So it's it shouldn't be seen as a oh it's a task we have to fulfill. It should definitely be seen as an opportunity. And I think particularly in the current situation we know that since more companies are you know, opening themselves up to the opportunity of remote working that, you know, there are a lot more opportunities for people out there now. So we have to we are really faced with the with the challenge to to really improve these onboarding experiences and do them in the best way possible. If we want to keep these really good people that we get in the door, because, again, you know, we know that the recruitment, the interview processes and all of those are are time consuming and costly. And if we're going to go to all that trouble to get somebody, we have to kind of continue on that good experience with that onboarding experience that's really positive to make sure that we keep those people that we've worked so hard to get. Um, and again, you know, this is kind of reiterating similar points, but just to say that, you know, the research does say that um, we would like to give employees the tools and support to succeed, but also from our perspective as, as organizations to see, well, who isn't a good fit? So it's not about, you know, every person that comes in the door is going to be absolutely perfect and suited to the organization. It's an opportunity for us to see, well, look, at there may be a couple of people who are struggling or maybe who aren't necessarily a perfect fit for the organization. So we can identify those people really early on um, and then, you know, maybe look to see the people people that were sort of next down on our list um, and again we know the cost um, it's 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 really significant so I suppose talking about poor onboarding isn't something we really want to get into in too much detail but this was a quote that I read that I thought oh it kind of sent a shiver down my spine thinking this is such a bad experience and you know it, it is sad when you have this kind of experience where on your first day something bad goes wrong and it could be something small or it could be the whole day's disaster and that's something as an organization we find extremely hard to come back from this is something that once someone's had a really bad experience it's very hard to to kind of you know get them back on board you're, you're kind of you know pushing back the ocean at that point so let's try to make the first few days at least as good as possible so people don't have these horrible experiences. So what can we do in relation to online onboarding? Well, we talked a little bit about the pre-work side of things and both kind of from an administrative perspective, but also, you know, getting somebody up and running with the organization, even before they set foot in the door. And even if they never set foot in the door, because we know a lot of people work remotely, it's a really nice way to get somebody feeling like they're part of the organization before they ever officially start. And it's, it can be little things like, you know, completing some of that pre-work, as we said, via online, but also, you know, some sort of soft introductions and um, some kind of maybe just a little bit of reading on the organization up front. It's to let a new employee know that, look, we know you're coming we're really excited to have you on board and so much so that even before you've started here's a couple of things if you'd like to read it up a little bit about us or you'd like to meet anyone before you come in this is something that we would definitely encourage and I think that's a really nice thing to do and we have um, uh, onboarded a few people remotely um, and learn of it ourselves and we found this works really nicely and when people join then they they kind of have familiar faces and familiar names before they even start which is really nice because it really helps with that those I suppose first day 
nerves. Um, so again, we talk about setting expectations. So think about that roadmap of activities. What are the things that you need the new employee to do in the first few days, months? You know, make sure that they have all that information up front. And I'll say again, you know, about sharing experiences, it's it's even down to the little things. If someone's about to come in the door on their first day and they don't know if there's going to be a canteen, and this is from one of my experiences, again, you know, it's it's sort of like, well, I didn't know if there was going to be a cafeteria. I wasn't sure whether I should bring something to eat. If I brought something to eat, where would I put it? There's all these little tiny little stresses that just tend to add to the bigger stress. Um, so I think just think about some of those things. Think about you. Put yourself in the, in the shoes of that new person and what you would need to know and try and give them that information up front. And again, we have to be quite explicit and, you know, facilitate these kind of online sessions with with their manager and other people. We have to make sure that the manager welcomes the new person, makes them feel like they're part of the organization. They're happy to be part of the team. And then, you know, set up some of those online sessions with relevant personnel that they're going to be working with or, you know, people that they're going to need to interact with at, at some point, you know, making sure that these are in. And these are done um, in the first few days and weeks is really important. But again, it's about, you know, balancing some of this and not giving them too much to do in the first few days that they feel overwhelmed. So think about the process and what's the best way to facil facilitate that. Um, and again, you know, anyone here from L&D, we're all about getting feedback from our learners, right? So it's very important to get feedback from the new recruit on the process, on the things that have worked well, that didn't work so well. You know, get a, get a structured questionnaire and sort of ask people at relevant points, you know, and in the process, you know, what's happening now? What, you know, what did you think about that? How would you change it, for example? And it, it gets, it's it's another thing to kind of get them involved in the new organization as in, okay, th these guys, you know, are interested in my opinion about this. Um, but also it helps us as an organization to learn from the experience and to make it even better from the next person that comes in the door. Um. And I see we have a few things coming in the chat, so I'll address them now in a couple of seconds, but I'll just go through these another couple of points here. Um, again, you know, we're talking about giving people assignments and if it's something like problem solving, try and get them engaging with each other. We also talk about, you know, how um, if you're doing a face-to-face -face induction session, you're meeting other new people to the organization. Um, so it's good to facilitate um, interaction with other new people but also with people that they're going to be working with. So if if possible, try and encourage some kind of online collaboration. Um, and again, Richie will talk a little bit about the tools and technologies that can support that, but try and get people interacting with each other as early as possible. So give them something to talk to people about. So again, as a new employee, it can be very hard to go and ask somebody for help or ask questions. But if they've been given an assignment, it's easier to make those introductions to say, Hi, Jim, you know, I'm, I'm working on something as part of my induction. Can you help me with this? So, again, it's, it's helping them to kind of integrate themselves. And it, it's very motivated and engaging to kind of get people interacting and engaging in an online space. Um, and again, we talk about the relevance. So make sure it's, it's sort of relevant to the, their new role or work area or department or whatever that might be. So it's not that they feel that they're getting something just for the sake of doing something. We talked already about a mentorship program, but think about what is it that the employee needs to get from this mentorship um, situation or experience, but also what does the mentor need? Do they need training in, you know, sort of developing a consistent approach to being a mentor? Like, what do they need to be able to be a good mentor? Um, and also, you know, think about the, the, their, the line manager person. You know, we often find that with um, onboarding experience is it can often be very subjective based on the manager that you have. So one person can say, wow, well, onboarding was brilliant. My manager brought me through this, that and the other we went for lunch. Um, you get a different manager and you have a totally different experience. So it's it's worth ensuring that the middle managers or the people that are going to be part of this onboarding experience understand what's required, understand also what's at stake from a business perspective, the cost of this onboarding experience that they mightn't necessarily get and ensuring that everyone's given a consistent, giving a consistent and, and positive experience um, insofar as they can to new employees. Again, we talk about, you know, employees who are working remotely, um, but also people who will, you know, maybe will be onboarded remotely, but will eventually be on, on the premises or on site. Um, so think about, you know, do we need to provide a different experience based on whether a person will continue to work, work remotely indefinitely or they will eventually, you know, be sort of be on site and, and get to meet people face to face. So maybe there are different experiences that we need to, to sort of facilitate there. 
Um, so we had a really nice comment here from Connor Donovan. Um, first job I started as country manager came to meet us and we were grads. That made a good impression. I think that's a really good one. I mean, I think it's it's really important to get those those people who are important in the organization to make the people coming in the door to feel important. And I honestly think because Con brought that up, I think it's something that obviously resonated with him and he remembered it. And because of that, it was a positive experience. So think about doing that, you know, for your employees um, as they come in the door. We've had some really nice ones as well from Paul Fitzgibbon, from Kira Masterson as well, moving to virtual delivery of our onboarding programs. Yeah. Um, having to adapt quickly again, you know, really important. That's something we're dealing with at the moment. But I think in relation to the current situation, we've had to sort of be very reactive. Um, but I think if we have some time now as we prepare to, you know, um, continue in this current situation or if we continue to onboard and have people work remotely, it's time now to be proactive and look at, well, what is the experience? Take a step back and look and see what we're trying to do. And again, we, we, we at Learn of It advocate for not jumping on the tools and technologies, but looking at, you know, what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? What are the challenges that we're trying to address? And then how does the technology fit in with that? So as I kind of mentioned, and I'm coming near the end of, of uh, my side of the presentation here, um, it's, it's you know, I think it's really important to say that facilitation of this online onboarding experience has never been more feasible. But what I'll add to that is also, it's really never been more important because as I said, you know, there are so many companies now that are open to uh, remote onboarding, but also remote working. Um, and because there are more jobs out there for people um, that are not sort of, um, they're, they're not restricted now by location. Uh, and for me in the West of Ireland, for example, you know, it, it can be a situation whereby there are only a certain amount of jobs in your kind of area or field of interest, for example. Now I'm seeing from, from talking to friends here in the West are saying, well, you know what, the companies are saying that they do a lot of remote onboarding. So I can work for a company that's based in Dublin. I can work for a company that's based in India, for example. And we know that. So we have to be, you know, we have to be providing these better experiences to kind of, to ensure that we're keeping these really good people that we're getting in the door. So at Learnovate, we're looking to create, whether that'll be a platform or framework to kind of look at, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing with in relation to remote onboarding and hopefully looking to see, well, how do we remove that requirement to be physically, physically present in the workplace um, for a remote onboarding experience while also thinking about, you know, the elements that we talked about earlier around how do we kind of engage people before they even join the organisation, before they even start. Um, and that's something that we're going to be looking at as part of our next steps um, um, as part of our project. So as Linda mentioned at the introduction, we would love more industry partners to get involved in this for us to really get a good understanding of what people's challenges are um, before we start to look at de developing out that solution. So I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm going to pass along to my wonderful co colleague, Dr. Richard Hart, who's going to talk through some of the tools and technologies um, that he has reviewed and researched um, as part of um, his phase of work on remote onboarding. So over to you, Richie, and um, I'm looking forward to um, seeing you all later. Thanks, Janet. Uh, thanks for that great presentation, some great food for thought there and a great introduction to the whole concept of of onboarding. So like uh, Janet said, I'm going to be talking a bit about the tools and technology that companies and employees could use for remote onboarding. And uh, I have a presentation here that I'm just going to share. And like Janet, once I share my presentation, I'm going to turn off my, my camera. So I'm going to give you a bit of a whirlwind introduction because there's not much time and there really are so many tools. But I want to first uh, review the four stages of onboarding to give you uh, just an idea of how we're going to map or where we're going to be mapping these pieces of technology onto. So Janet discussed earlier our four, the four stages that we kind of identified in our research. So the pre-boarding, the introduction orientation, the assignments and the ongoing work and development. So I think as as anyone who's ever had a job, we can all identify with these four stages. Um, but the thing is, with the whole, what's happened in the last 12 months uh, with the rise of remote working, these four stages will probably look a little bit different to how they look in these pictures. So I think we're all probably familiar with this picture um, of like a home workstation and having all your stuff squeezed into a small space or kind of these kind of uh, desks that are kind of ad hoc and piecemeal. And so the, the picture that I showed you in the previous slide might look a little bit more like this. So 
you get the job, but then your first day is kind of Zoom introductions or uh, Skype introductions. Your first project is probably uh, alone in your sitting room or in your home office with a laptop. And you're keeping track of projects and stuff remotely via software or via uh, video meetings. So you don't get that kind of uh, collaboration with employees in physical spaces. Um, so the question is, what tools uh, are available to, to kind of count to, to overcome some of those, those pain points? Um, so we have our, our four stages and there are just a lot of activities in those stages that may need some sort of technology assistance. Um, and especially in the first two stages of onboarding. So your pre-boarding and your, um, your introduction period. So you can see even in those two stages, there's documents, there's checklists, there's medical certs, there's welcome letters, there's welcome packages, user manuals, uh, tours, meet and greets, knowledge sharing, uh, you know, you're setting up your software, accounts, passwords, all that kind of stuff. So those first two stages are really key. And there's just a lot for the employee, as Janet said earlier, a lot for the employee to take in in those first few days. Um, uh, of a new job. Then things start to slow down a bit, but the need for kind of uh, project management and the role of mentors and check-ins with your manager become more important then as you progress past those first few days into the first few weeks. Um, and then, as Janet said, it's really not a case of the onboarding ending after a certain amount of time. It's more about the ongoing development, especially from that learning, uh, learn L and D perspective, that we want to keep the employee going, and we want to continue their learning into their new role. So, just to share a couple of quick statistics with you before we get into the technology, and like, needless to say, there's been a lot of surveys and research done in the last twelve months around this because it's such a hot topic, and because businesses are really recruiting remote uh, workers now. So in a recent survey by BusinessWire, 36% of employees, employers listed lack of available technology to automate and organize onboarding programs as a major challenge to successful onboarding, while 58% said there was too much focus on processes and paperwork. Um, from a recruitment perspective, the challenge of training remote onboarders was cited as the top recruitment concern in 2020 by work, Workable Survey. And in, in the same survey, um, 51% of managers said their biggest challenge was maintaining candidate engagement throughout the onboarding process. Um, and that was specifically talking about remote hire. So you can see those are big numbers and big percentages jumping out that remote onboarding is a real potential pain point uh, for, uh, for companies. Um, so technology, we all probably know what technology um, is, is already used around remote work. I think we're all familiar with uh, the likes of our email servers like Outlook, um, our instant messengers, Google Chats, our video conferencing like Teams, Zoom, uh, email, Gmail, uh, Skype, Slack, S Cisco. So these are all basically communication tools and um, maybe uh, file management systems and calendar management systems that we are probably mo most of us are familiar with at least one of these tools and they are really great for collaboration but if, if we if we think about the activities that were listed in our four stages of onboarding some of these tools won't really help us with a lot of those activities or you could kind of try and fit them to the activities but they're not really going to be a perfect fit. So we need to talk about more specific tools. So communication social tools, that was the kind of tools you just saw on the last slide. But we looked at seven more categories of tools in our review of uh, remote onboarding technology. So we looked at tools for digitized documentation, introduction tools, checklists, project management and workflow tracking, HR management, mentor management, and LMSs and knowledge bases. So I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction to each of those categories and give you a couple of examples of uh, some tools in each of those categories. So digitized documents is 
so the management of documents uh, is a key activity in the first phase of stage of onboarding, which is the pre-boarding. Um, so we all probably have experienced the filling out documents and medical certs and contracts and trying to get them back to our employers. And from an employer perspective, you know, there's a lot of documents to manage and keep track of and make sure everything is, is all wrapped up before the first day the employee comes into the office so that they can get paid, that you know that they're okay medically and that they have all their, they've agreed to everything that's going to happen on the, uh, in their new role. So like there are lo lots of really cool and simple tools. So a lot of these tools are just really simple. They're just good ways to track and sign documents. And they, from both perspectives, the employee and the employer can keep track of uh, what documents they need to sign, what they need to read, when it has to be back to the employer by. And the, a lot of these um, devices or these tools are really device friendly, so they can be used on smartphones and uh, tablets to sign contracts and to sign medical certs. Introduction tools. So. In those first two stages of onboarding, the introductions are really key. And really, it shouldn't really be left to that second stage, which is your orientation. It really should happen in the pre-boarding phase. So when you get the job, both employee and employer should have the opportunity to introduce themselves to each other, introduce themselves to the wider team, and, and really get to know each other. So they can, uh, from an employee perspective, they can really find out where they fit in in this new role. And from an employer perspective, it gives them the chance to send the right message to a new hire about who they are and what the employee might expect from their first few weeks in work. So there are loads of tools that where you can create bios, introduction videos and welcome pages with links to documentation and resources. And like I said, especially useful in the pre-boarding stage. So Kin is one where you can uh, look create profiles for each of your team and give a new employee access to that so they can see what everyone does. HR Partner allows you to create a bio of yourself with your interests and what you like. And Wistia Video is one I like because it allows uh, the employer to create videos with hyperlinks within the video so you can, you can direct employees to documentation, uh, user manuals, training manuals, uh, you know, t tricks and tips for, for their new role. Um, checklists. So the, the, this is obviously, these are obviously quite simple tools, but some of them are really, have really nice user interfaces that allow um, employers and employees to keep track of what tasks need to be done. So that could, again, could be around documentation, but it could just be about, you know, what, what you're supposed to get done on your first week or what training you might need to do. Um, so there's a lot of different, these tools offer a lot of different checklist templates. Um, so clickboarding is one. Um, type lane is one that is really good for employees to keep track of where employees are in the onboarding process and how far they're on their checklists and if they need to follow up with employees to complete certain tasks or return certain documents. Um, chief onboarding is another one, really simple interface with cool little checklists and tick boxes and you can do checklists on a day by day or a week by week basis. So HR onboarding management. So for the HR teams out there where a lot of the burden with onboarding and especially that kind of administrative and bureaucratic uh, side of onboarding comes in and um, HR teams like really need to utilize uh, modern tools to especially when it comes to remote uh, on borders because it's no longer possible to kind of drop a document down to the office. And uh, another thing that these tools really do is they take the burden off email. Like in one of my first slides, I kind of introduced Outlook and Gmail. Like we ourselves here in Learnovate use the Google Suite. Um, and like the emails can come, become a really bur a real burdensome thing for especially a new employee to keep track of. But for a HR team, if, there, if, if, if 10 new employees have joined the company, then those emails are gonna come really, start really building up. So um, some of these are enterprise solutions, so they, they support all elements of human capital management. Um, and some of them have really uh, specific uh, templates for onboarding. So Bamboo HR is one, 
Um, again, a lot of these are aimed at tracking like the documents and what an employee needs to give to their employer, employer in those first few weeks of work. Um, but a lot of them have cool graphics that you can keep track uh, in a very data visualized way of where employees are in their onboarding process. Um, so Bamboo HR and Namely and Zenefits are just three of the tools, but there are lots out there. This is a, a one that Jana touched on is mentor management. So um, I, I think it's a really interesting area and something that's maybe hard to emulate in the, in the virtual domain. Um, and in a survey by Clipboarding, which is one of the tools we, we saw earlier for, for um, uh, checklists, on, onboarding checklists, they, they found that 56 of them, 56% of employees said they would like the support of mentors or buddies during their onboarding. So it's hard to emulate that in the virtual domain. You can't physically meet with someone, what we would all think about how a mentor would, would be, like you see in the picture there, sitting down with someone, telling them how you're getting on, what kind of problems you're facing. But these tools try to, you know, they try to build profiles from mentors, um, match them up with employees, you know, schedule meetings. And it's something that not only the employee can keep track of, but the employer can keep track of what mentors are assigned to new employees, how often they're meeting and what, what the outcomes of those meetings are. Another really cool one is Cooper. That actually gives you, it's kind of like a Tinder for, um, for mentors. It kind of gives you a match about, you know, uh, people with similar roles or similar interests and it matches them up as mentors and me um, mentorees. So, that, that's a really cool one and it has a nice interface for, for that matching. Um, project management is something that we're probably all familiar with and we're probably familiar with some of the tools, but some of these project management tools have really uh, powerful and cool um, onboarding templates for managing those first couple of projects that uh, an employee might carry out in their new role. Um, especially for a remote employee uh, starting out, you, you might find it hard to get to grips with how a company manages their projects because all companies do it differently. So, you know, these, these tools can have onboarding templates where they can really give an employee a good introduction to how a project has worked. You can give them sample projects. You can give them an onboarding project to do where you can, uh, a manager can track the progress of the first few weeks. And like, like a lot of these tools, they come with really nice visualizations great use of color and graphs and pie charts and all that kind of thing. And it allows employees and employers to see where they are in their projects. And so Basecamp and I done this are, are two of the ones I liked, but there are loads of other ones. And something that Janet mentioned earlier, actually, which I think is really important, and we could have had a category for this uh, on its own, and it's about surveys. So kind of checking in with your employees on a regular basis. Like it's one thing to ask employees, you know, in a meeting how they're feeling and how they're getting on. And sometimes you won't always get the response that um, an, an honest response, but the type form is a tool that can allow for kind of uh, anonymous surveys. And um, it can really allow the, uh, the, employee, the employer to check in with the employee on a regular basis and kind of get their feedback, not just for an individual employee, but the, the, the employees as a whole. So um, now I, there is a category on social and communications, but I've already talked about a lot of the, um, the kind of uh, video conferencing and instant messenger ones. So I'm not gonna go over that again. I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples of what uh, companies are, how they're being creative in this space. So um, here's one like about, you know, always on virtual environments. So instead of having a video conferencing schedule, you kind of just have a link where there's always a meeting going on and you can just go in and out as you feel. And it could be just a informal thing, like a room to go in and just chat, like a coffee room. Um, but Steve Mass from Delvina, he recommends that and they use a tool called Discord. Um, and another one then is kind of a, you know, virtual speed dating, but you know, obviously it doesn't have to be dating, but it just could be to share hobbies, interests, family and roles. Um, so for like a group of new onboard onboardees, that could be a really important uh, piece of technology and a really important activity that they could do. Um, knowledge bases. So again, Janet touched on the whole area of um, information sharing in your, especially in those first two, two, the first three stages, I would say, but particularly in stage two, when you're getting to know what everyone else does and you're getting to know all the tips and tricks. Um, 
you know, with something like, you know, where do I access this this document or what's the procedure for this or how should I, what's my, what should my email signature be? So knowledge bases are, are really cool tools for kind of automating some of those common questions that employees would have. So kind of like FAQs or chatbots. So Procrox knowledge is one. So a company can create their own bespoke kind of search engine which could guide employees to certain documents or certain material. Um, OB.AI is a you can is like a chatbot where you can customize that the, the chatbot would answer questions about your company. Like there's an example there, what is our brand colors? And OB gives you the answers in kind of you know hex and RGB format. So they can be they can get really powerful and really customized to the, the common questions within your company. And you can build your own chatbots. So chatbot builder, there are loads of them out there. Um, and you can build your own uh, questions and answers. And you can actually, a lot of these kind of tools are integrated, can be integrated into Slack, which is really cool. So you can have a Slack channel that is just an AI where it can answer questions that a, a new employee might have. Um, learning management systems. So again, this is something that we would all probably be, a lot of us would be familiar with, especially if you're from an L&D background. And, Obviously, training and learning and development is really important for new employees. So LMSs, we, we consider them different to knowledge bases because knowledge bases are good for kind of picking up that, those informal bits of information. LMSs provide a learning path for employees to develop new skills, and it's, they're particularly important in stage three and four when the employee moves beyond the introduction phase into their assignments and ongoing work. And I just picked two, Talent LMS and Cornerstone. Again, really nice interfaces for employers to keep track of employees and what their learning paths are. And a lot of these allow employees to customize their own learning paths and decide what skills they want to learn in their first few months of work and, and where they want to be after their first 12 months. So, so that, that brings us kind of to the end, um, and I'll, I'll sum up uh, with some, some, some more information in the next slide, but that, there are the eight categories. Again, there is some overlap there, and we could have had more categories, but I think that covers the, the categories of tools that uh, employers should really be thinking about to support their employees and support themselves, not just the employees, and support their HR teams in remote onboarding. Um, so what, what's, what's going to happen going forward or how, how do you negotiate this kind of minefield of all these different, like, as I said, we, we reviewed 40 pieces of technology. We could have reviewed more. And in the slides, I've only shown you about 15 or 18 uh, examples. So cost is one consideration. All, nearly all of these tools have free versions, but to access some of the key features, um, you're going to have to pay. And if you have multiple tools, the costs are going to add up, especially if it's like a monthly subscription. Um, needs analysis, you just have to sit down and decide which tools are best, which have the most features, where, what will add the most value to your organization. Find your pain points and go from there. So sit down and think about what your pain points are. It's something that we do and learn about. We do jobs to be done workshops and we give, uh, try and find, help customers find out what their pain points are. Think about what tool will uh, relieve most of your pain points. Is it documentation? Is it managing? you know, um, introductions, is it video chat, is it, you know, uh, project management. So think about what your pain points are. Have, so, have consistency, don't keep changing tools. Companies are realizing that they need a consistent and robust suite of remote tools to support remote, remote activities. And not just for remote onboarding, but for all of their work, all of their collaboration, and not just internally, but also externally with other clients. And just remember, as a parting shot, technology can solve everything. It can't emulate everything you do in the physical workspace. So you just have to be conscious of that and not put too much burden on your technology and understand that sometimes technology will fail and it won't cover everything. I'm gonna hand you back over to uh, Linda now. So I'm really excited now. This is the part that I always love um, on events like these is the panel discussion. And um, so I'd like to invite Janet, Marie and Neha so Marie is National Director, um, Network Director with Skillsoft, Software Skillsoft, and Neha is Learning Design Learning, who are both members of Learnovate. So interesting um, insights there from the work so far, I suppose, just even looking at the chat, um, 
noted that there was 120, I think, new starters over the last 14 months. What are the challenges, and I'll pose it to all the panel today, uh, what are the challenges you have experienced with onboarding people in the current online environment? Um, I can take that. So, hi, everybody. I'm Neha Budge from Orion Learning. Um, I suppose I've come to this from with a sort of unique perspective in that I joined Orion last July in the middle of the pandemic. So I sort of have direct experience of a really great remote onboarding process. Um, we're expanding our team at the moment. Actually, we're hiring for several positions at the moment. And uh, actually, I have a new learning designer who's starting next week. So this is all very timely for me as well. And for me, the biggest challenge is how can I enable a new team member to become embedded in the team? And how can I get them to really work with that company culture? Um, and also, how can I introduce the social aspect that's often missing when you're not in the office setting every day? And we can try and counteract this by you know, having a robust and varied pre-boarding yeah. onboarding plan. Um, we can ensure that apart from getting someone productive quickly, that people also across the organization have a chance to get to know the new person. So some of the suggestions that Richie was working through about things like um, um, uh, speed dating on Slack, meeting new colleagues. I'm talking about something that isn't necessarily work focused. That's the kind of thing that that would really help that social aspect. Yeah, and I think as well for for organisations, it I suppose the big thing is, um, and I've heard from people you know that I know starting it, it particularly with, with remote, is getting the equipment to their staff as well mm -hmm. in a time so that they're not waiting. Where I think there's been kind of a an understanding if you arrive in the office and you don't have your laptop or your phone's not ready for a day or two, it doesn't really matter. But I think now because more and more people are remote, that's a bigger impact for staff. Um, yeah. Janet? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, as I said, we've been onboarding people really, the, you know, since since early last year. So we've seen this happening within the organization. And um, I think, you know, to our credit and to the credit of, you know, our operations manager and, and the people that work within the center, I think we've developed out some really nice approaches to how to get um, both sides of it, I suppose, you know, the, the kind of documentation side of things and, you know, getting people up and running, you know, um, on our systems and stuff before they even start. So we, we'll see that people have email addresses or they've been added to Slack maybe the Friday before they start. So at Learnovate, we're very social anyway. So we, we would kind of have, you know, those initial hi, welcome to Learnovate sort of things. But also, um, I suppose what Neha is saying about the the element and um, we we do really encourage that as well so we have um and i suppose it, it's not necessarily to totally focused on onboarding but we do a lot of social type interactions whereby we put things in the calendar that are you know every a couple of times a week we have coffee together and it's just a social let's get a coffee or we have an online lunch whereby people just bring their lunch we had our christmas you know event online we all went to netflix and watched a movie i think all that kind of stuff is really helping people to kind of integrate themselves into the organization but also i mean we're learning as we go as well so we've been talking to everyone and, and actually richie as well who's just given his presentation was was you know on board remotely and I've been learning a lot from him about what worked well you know from his perspective or things we could have we could have done a little bit better um but I think you know it's 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 nice I think the nice part is well we talk about some of the challenges but again we have the opportunity to provide really nice experiences to take away some of the stress and I think that's a couple of things that have come from discussions we've had with people we've onboarded as well at learn about as in the you know that first day and yeah. um, the first day of stress, I'm going to walk into a new office and feel like the new person. And, you know, that's kind of taken away to a certain extent because, you know, you're sitting hopefully in the comfort of, you know, your own home office or whatever. And you're meeting people gradually um, in a structured way, in a face to face chat. And, you know, and, and, and it takes away some of that. Oh, I'm going to meet everyone all at the same time. It's like, well, this person does that. And you're, it's it's a really gradual, nice introduction. And I do think, you know, and even actually we had someone start learning about this week and just in talking to her it was like well you know the first day she kind of eased into it we had a good few chats she met a couple of people and then the next day you know it was a little bit more and a little bit more and it's about sharing information gradually and not making people feel overwhelmed and I think that can be done really well in that in that remote environment um, um, I think Moira has some interesting things to say about this even from discussions we've had in in some of the, the people that she's been working with who are onboarding a lot of people at the same time I think that's a totally different challenge and I think somebody mentioned it in the chat you know I think unless you're onboarding an awful lot of people, why would you invest in a tool? Why would you not use the tools that you already have? So, and, and Moira, I think was you were saying before when we were chatting about an organization you were working with who were onboarding like a bunch of people all together. That's a whole different, whole different challenge, I think. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we're seeing, it's, it's interesting, the whole concept of onboarding, we're seeing as many companies go through a reboarding experience mm. for staff who've been on furlough, have been in short-term work, possibly for a period of time. So onboarding is beginning to almost merge with a reboarding. But what our companies most talk about is, and I think I've seen it, I saw it on the chat there just joined a few minutes ago, um, is the challenge of how to enable people to really feel part of an organisation when there's no water cooler conversations, when there's mm. no interactions in the corridor, when you can't head off to lunch with your manager or go for a pint after work. How do you help people who are new recruits to feel part of the organisation? Now, in our software skill net, we are focused very much on training and development. So we do an awful lot of training and development with our companies, pre-boarding yeah. or yeah. early stage onboarding. And that has got other challenges that bring with it, particularly in companies where one of our members has onboarded 350 people in the last two months, another one has onboarded 80 people and all of those people need to get specific skills before they can be put onto client sites or before they really can operate yeah. well i'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you, you you're you're touching on that point marie as well because i think even within the chat that that's so important that pre-onboarding and how can that be improved for organizations and for the employees and it's potentially an area that that people have overlooked in the past and um, so it's, it's great to, to touch on that i think the other thing that we've seen a lot of is and um i actually saw a study recently and it was you know when you're in violent agreement with study from your own experience and it's it's very much around that issue that um we'll be talking about in our working group around how many people can actually leave during the ongoing of the onboarding experience if it isn't a really good experience mm. for them and a report that we made recently essentially said people leave managers they don't leave businesses so including all of the stakeholders hr leadership and particularly line managers in the experience from right from day one when somebody arrives and finding ways to do that is absolutely critical and one or two of our companies have really focused on that and it's made a significant difference and um i suppose then you know what what are some of the best practices that you've seen um maybe i'll ask Neha um in industry on onboarding employees remotely like i know you spoke about your own experience there but i suppose is there other best practices that you've um seen would work I would say pre-boarding as well. So along with the forms and all the legal stuff that has to be done, really making sure that someone is set up with access to systems before day one. Mm. And also that they have some light pre-reading to do before day one. So when they arrive, they can access everything, but also they're starting to think about the organization and think about the culture even before they land. Um, and, you know, as, as, as ever, less of a focus on the HR and the legal stuff and more of a focus on the team so that the new starter feels part of a mm. community. Um, Definitely. And I think what we're hearing in the industry is that more and more people are going to actively choose to work from home going forwards, at least part of the time. So you're going to have situations where even team members who've been around for a while don't meet each other for periods of time because they're not in the office in a given day. So, you know, it's even more important for us to facilitate that team cohesion virtually. It's not just for the people that are joining, but for everybody else. Mm. We want to make sure that everyone is supported. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And how, 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 how important, I suppose, is it to, or how do you get the staff to engage in those social tools? It has to be structured and then some of it has to be organic and we, we kind of facilitate both. Yeah, I agree. And it, there has to be a sort of the, we call it the what's in it for me, do you know, to, to, to engage with some of these things. And I, it was Tara Kenny, I think, in the chat was saying, you know, one of the things that, that that is a challenge is that first day lunch. That's such a big part, I think, of somebody's first day is being taken for lunch, um, whether that's in the canteen or, or out for lunch, whatever, with, with new employees. And how do you facilitate that, which I think was her question. And especially with people in different time zones, I think 
think it's really important to offer the opportunities to be able to do that. And we have people actually working um, in different different time zones that learn of it too. So we try to be aware of, you know, what time somebody might have a cup of coffee at. And we have a couple of options in the calendar for if you want to join, have a coffee together. And it's those little, little small things that do make a big difference because I think, you know, we talked already about the socialization aspect and how do we encourage that where people don't feel like as a new employee that they're, they're proving themselves or have to show their know-how or whatever, that it is a purely social gathering whereby it has to be led by the people, I think, who are already in the organization to say, oh, here, we're not here to talk about work. I'm just wondering, like, do you have any pets? What are you watching on TV? You know, blah, blah, blah. And we do that at Learn of It a lot. We have also, we have like, since the lockdown, we've had like a weekly challenge, which I really enjoy. So each week someone comes up with a different challenge that we all have to do and we share photos of it or videos or whatever. And it's what I'm, I've been really enjoying about that is um, that we've gotten really to see people's home lives a bit more or, you know, even um, understanding what people's interests are. And I think it's worked really well and it could be something that we might necessarily do as well in the office, right? Because these 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 sort of conversations happen organically, but we're sort of facilitating them in a remote space with the kind of challenges that we're doing. And I, it's just been it's just been really good. And we get to see the artistic side of some of our colleagues as well, which has been absolutely brilliant. So I think doing little bits and pieces like that, but making sure you don't forget them is really important. But also being aware of, you know, people's time zones, you know, people's schedules, whether people would have coffee at a certain time, blah, 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 all the things that kind of Tara brought up there and, and Sharon kind of mentioned as well, being aware of when people break bread, for example. It, it's that kind of stuff to take into account, you know, what people need and when and how to facilitate it, um, which, is, which is really, really nice. I think it's re- it's really nice, I think, as a new employee to feel like, oh, yeah, there's a social side of here as well as, you know, the work, even yeah, when we're even, remote. Yeah, exactly, because you're missing those water cooler moments that you wouldn't, you know, it's it's trying to it's having those planned uh, interactions that you wouldn't necessarily have when you're in that um, building, when you're in the yeah. environment of the yeah. office itself. So I suppose that leads on to my next question then around, um, you know, how do you think the experience is or should be different for employees who will eventually turn to the office uh, versus those who will continue to remote workly and how? So Maria, I'm going to ask you yeah, that one first. It's, it's, it's an interesting one mm. to see either or because what we're seeing particularly in the tech sector is that a lot of decisions have been made around that and pretty much every company I've talked to is adopting a hybrid model um, and made quite significant decisions around that in the middle of last year. So more and more companies that I talk to say we will never all be back in the office sitting at desks yeah. in that particular building full time from now on. So we'll yeah. have a hybrid model. And that's essentially because A, there's a lot of advantages for companies in terms of costs and location and having a flexible workforce, but also study after study and um, a number of um, large employers that we would work with in tech have done staff sentiment surveys mm. asking them these questions. When everybody went remote, suddenly people went realized we can work remotely. And then yeah. companies started asking people, mm. well, how do you feel about staying remotely? Do you want to go back to the office? Has it got any advantages for you? We all know the disadvantages with the screaming kids and all sorts of things around homeschooling. But what has come back from staff is we want that hybrid model. And in the digital sector, it's very easy to enable that. Mm -hmm. Um, And companies then are just putting hot desks in. So people can come in, they can interact for a day a week where you really do need to be with your colleagues. But for three to four days a week, people will be working remotely. So I think that we're looking at a whole new work model here going forward and how we adapt to that as employees and as companies and as organizations and all of our HR processes within that context. Yeah. Janet, anything to add to that? No, no. I mean, Moira's had some really interesting things to say there. I don't think there's anything I can really add that we sort of hadn't sort of discussed already to be honest um unless Neha has anything she wants to add there um 
any other yeah, no, questions from, really from the audience, please post them there in the chat. We'd we'll be happy to, to ask the panel members. Yeah, as well. I mean, um, Linda, I suppose it, it is. I mean, it, I, as I said, sort of in the presentation, I think it's just being aware of the fact that some people won't be physically present and what they might need from that perspective. And it's it's nearly when we look at online learning, I think we have to be aware that one of the major problems with people learning online is feelings of isolation, right? Or, you know, feelings that they're alone. And that's something that we we are looking at and learn of it too. We're looking at the learner as as a person, not that we would normally see them as a person, but looking at the whole experience that a learner has in relation to their well-being and, you know, ha, ha, you know, we want them to learn, but also we want them to be in a in a space where they feel, you know, relaxed and comfortable. And that's all part of being, you know, working remotely is having, you know, those feelings that I'm not isolated. I'm still part of a team, um, even if I'm working remotely and making sure that they, they do feel that so that they can still engage with learning. So obviously Learnivate, we're very focused on the learning side of people. But I think it's important to have the supports in place so the person feels confident in the role and all those other things that ensure that, that you know, they provide a better learning experience and they're more open to learning. Because we know that a stressed mind, you know, doesn't make memories and that it doesn't necessarily engage with learning as well. So we we want people to be as comfortable and relaxed and feel, you know, that they're not alone as much as possible. So that, that's all I would say, I think, in relation to that, we have to be aware, you know, of, of you know, what we've been experiencing. And I think especially the people that have been thrust into the sort of online space um, who, who maybe didn't, you know, weren't already used to it. And I know myself and Neha have already been working online, you know, working remotely for quite a long time. So we kind of, we already have our sort of best practices in place whereby, you know, we have our desk that's away from, you know, so we have to go to work. And I think we talked about that before, Neha. It's so important to have somewhere that's not your kitchen yeah table because it otherwise the mental break between work and home is much harder to make and even if it's a you know it's a piece of cardboard screen that keeps you away from the rest of your life it's 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 those little important important things that are so important when we think about what we're recommending to people who will work remotely and it's things that I think we can learn from people like myself and Neha or people who have worked online worked remotely for a long time what is it that you're doing that makes it work for you you know and and we talked before about you know setting our you know our deadlines at the end of the day and that 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 and we're finding that a lot I think from talking to people in industry that our our days tend to creep into our evenings a lot more easily now because yeah. you're not physically getting up and going somewhere else it can be and so that, easy to mix yeah. it you know that is yeah the challenge as those cons as opposed to there around you know being people being uh, envious of those remote workers in the past um, and particularly mm. like I worked in commercial side side of things and it, you you'd always have that kind of friction between the staff that are in the office and the staff that are out and are they yeah. really out there or are they just driving around you know the sales staff and so forth and it's now you know you're saying well actually now you can see that you can be productive at home but yeah there are challenges and it's not always the nice environment that everyone pictures oh you know they have that flexibility yes but you have to be able to motivate yourself to be yeah. able to, to exactly. get on with exactly. that and, and to hand. switch off exactly and, and that's and that's the thing that can be very difficult so people say oh yeah you know it's so nice for you you're just sitting there at home blah 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 but actually from my perspective I work better, I get more done, I'm not as distracted and I can move between meetings a lot faster, which I think is something, you know, you know, we have to, again, look at the opportunities that are being afforded to us now with this remote working. And we're finding at Learnivate that even our workshops work so much better online because people don't necessarily have to travel. There's not all the extra things that go along with when we're trying to document what we've done in a workshop, whereas before we would have taken photographs of whiteboards, for example. Now we're using tools like Miro that allow us to kind of keep track of all the all the workshopping, the good workshopping stuff we've done, get people engaged and use it as a working document. So again, we need to take a step back and look and see, well, I know this can be a hassle or a challenge, but also let's look and see what the opportunities are. What are we actually able to do better now that we're in this space? And I think that's something that we kind of will will look at more as we move forward. And as I said, kind of in the presentation, it's it's about, you know, not being as reactive, but being proactive now in, in how we're addressing things. I think that's... Mm -hmm. And just drawing on um, the poll, Janet, I'm not sure whether you have the, the results there. And um, just to give everyone a flavor, I suppose, um, what came out on top was new employees uh, feel welcome and part of the organization mm. and its culture. I don't think there's any surprises there with that one. Um, and then yeah, I su no, I suppose, and, and that is true, Linda, but also I think sometimes it, it, it depends on where your, you know, what your lens is or where you're coming at it from, right? So okay. whether you're a HR person who needs to get the job done, not that you wouldn't be thinking about 
the new employee having a good experience, but maybe that's someone else's job. Do you know, whereas if you're the kind of person who has to make sure all the documentation is sent over, for example, maybe that's, you know, so I'm, I'm interested and I'm glad to hear that that's, that's the kind of one that came out on top, do you know? Any comments from yourself, Nehan, Marie? I, I would I would I would fully agree with that that shift in perspective maybe from what the organization needs to get on with the people to the actual person experience because when you take it from a person experience a personal experience and it was interesting in some of the work that we've been doing around this that we're very much looking from the organization's perspective mm, and yeah. it struck me that it would be interesting to look at it from the new recruits perspective and yeah. absolute 100 their persona i do think that the other thing that we need to be very aware of is that almost implicit in a discussion onboarding is people come into full-time permanent jobs and stay there for quite a while and mm. um, we know that 60% of people within a short period of time are going to be gig workers, project workers, contractors, and all of those people are going to be part of an organization. So onboarding in the context of not a once and done or not only for permanent employees, I think is something that we really need to consider because apparently within a very short period of time that's where we'll all be in the gig economy or in project work and not full time with employers mm. yeah yeah that's a really good point exactly um and so janet I'm, I'm sure this question has been asked um how do people get involved in the research how does it work um, well, there's there's lots of information that we could provide on that. But what we're we're looking um, for our industry partners to get involved with, and, and Neha and, and Moira, their input into our project to date has been absolutely invaluable. So as we say, we within Learn of it, we work um, very much in the the area of applied research. And um, so we like to get industry involved as much as possible, as early as possible, so that we're addressing challenges that are actually um, out there within industry. Um, so I guess the best way to get involved or learn more about us is to contact us through that email address that was provided to everybody, because um, we can obviously address specific questions because we do so many different types of research projects from European projects to bespoke pieces of work to the core or the the research that we do that's funded by you know um that's funded within the center that we work with industry to make sure that the the research that we're doing is relative uh, you know is is of value to industry so we have so many different ways of doing that and i think myself and yourself linda spend a lot of time talking to people about the kind of research yeah. that we do so i think if anyone would like to contact us, we'd be happy to have conversations or share more information about what we do at Learnovate um, or how you might get involved. So we would encourage anyone who's interested in this topic or anything that you see from our website that you might want to get involved in, you know, or you're interested in or you think you would like to get involved in a solution or even helping just to understand the problems, please do get in touch with us because we're always looking for people um, to engage with us and for us to work collaboratively because we're very much a collaborative organisation. So we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and if anyone wants to find out a little bit more today, Tom is in the Learnvate room Absolutely. there as well, so yep. he'll be Hi, able to keep you posted. And um, so with that, I know it's really I could spend a little bit more time Me talking too. to you. It's so <laughs> short, I feels like um, we'll definitely leave the panel discussion for a longer uh, period next time round. But thank you so much, um, Janet, Marie, and Naya for taking the time to talk to us and cover this really relevant topic. I think not just for now, but for, for companies in the future as well, as we were talking about that hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. um, so we hope the audience enjoys the first of our Link and Learn series of 2021. And our next event takes place on the 15th of April. And we'll be discussing um, the business value of LMD within that one. So with that, from me, thanks very much. See you in the 15th.